Albanian blood. Not a gang, need my hand like I'm John Alida. On my brand, Benjamin's like I'm John Alida. John Alida. Hey, hello, everybody. This is the Johnny and Gene Show, week four. I uh, hope everybody out there is healthy, your families are well. And uh, this week, we got a really special guest, uh, a very good friend of mine, and uh, been friends for about 35 years. Uh, he was a guy that in the neighborhood was uh, known to be very dangerous involved with the mafia and a guy that I actually uh, really looked up to and I wanted to walk in his shoes. And as a kid, obviously, he didn't know me and didn't know that uh, his he gave an impression on me that uh, I wanted to follow. And he stayed with friends of mine uh, at Gene's family, Fat Andy Ruggiano and his sons, Albert and Anthony. And he personally worked for uh, Nicky Carrazzo. This is a guy that uh, I followed back then, and as the years went on and I changed my life, uh, I, I look up to him now in a different way. And uh, this is Gene, my co my co uh, sponsor, and excuse me. This is Gene. Uh, he's uh, my partner on the show, and this is Robert Engels, also known as Robert Morelli. And uh, I was really a special guest. Let Robert say hello to you guys. Hey, hello everybody. I hope everybody's doing well. Hope everybody's being blessed and staying safe. And um, let's get on with the show, man. Whatever you do, don't use the word shoot, especially with those two guys. <laughs> hey, so Robert, um, uh, as you know, like you're a lot older than me, and um, I heard a lot of stories about you through the neighborhood, you know, when I was young. And um, I know you're very close to my cousin and everything like that. And um, I really would like you to explain to people about you know, maybe your involvement and what you were kind of doing in the street a little bit so they can understand a little bit about you. All right, not a problem with that. Um, basically, you know, I always go from the beginning, growing up in, in, you know, in the 50s, 60s. And you got to remember what I try to explain to people is back in them days, when I watched TV, it was mostly all gangster movies. It was uh, Bowery Boys, you know. So I emulated them when I was a kid, run through grocery stores, you know, a fruit stand, drop some piece of fruit. And then we had, you know, a lot of street games back in them days also. So, you know, you had to either learn how to do two things, and sometimes you had to use both of them. You had to either learn how to fight or flight. So it was one or the other, because that's how it was. You went in from one territory to another territory. So you had to try to be a, 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 a fighter. And that's, I learned how to be a, a little tough guy. And guys in the neighborhood who protected the neighborhood, and I don't know how much to to elaborate on this here because my days was a lot different than your guys' days as far as with the mob and stuff. You know, the mob back in my days, guys had social clubs. And they kind of protected the neighborhood. Uh, uh, I don't know if you remember, if you've seen the movie, uh, not, not just Goodfellas, but also the movie Bronx Tale, how they groomed that little young kid, you know, throughout that, uh, and how the guys had the bar there and they had a lot of club downstairs and took care of the neighborhood, and that's how I grew up, and those guys took a liking to me. I was a tough kid, you know, and they took a liking, and I used to run errands for them, but at the age of 17 years old, I ran into your, your, your cousin, Anthony, and started hanging out with him, so I went from Brooklyn to Queens, and when we started hanging out there, basically what we did was I was interested in building a reputation. Now, hanging out with somebody that has a wise guy for a dad, you didn't get a reputation because it would always be about Andy's son, Fat Andy's son, Fat Andy's son. So me, I had to stand out a little bit more. I needed a lot of attention and I needed a reputation. So I'd be the guy. So we broke up bars, we did bar fights and stuff like that. And then how I really started like getting involved with them was when Anthony's dad would have these banquets kind of things where people would come. Uh, I was like 17 years old at the time, and he would every Friday night, he'd have a big spread, big meal, and everybody would come there and pay tribute to him and honor him, and, and me as a 17-year-old sitting down with all these type of wise guys and stuff like that, it's, it, you know, just, I think it went to my head, and I became, started becoming, but I wanted to be like Fat Andy, you know, I wanted to be that there. I didn't realize at that time that I had a German last name. And I didn't know that I couldn't get straightened out until like two years after being involved with the mob. That kind of took me back a little bit, to be honest, because I knew that I would have to maybe take some slack off of people who got straightened out. And I wasn't the type of guy that liked to take slack off of anybody. So I know I'd probably be in a lot of trouble. 
But that well, started. Right. Go ahead. Robin, you were, uh, I, I guess you're about 10 years older than me. So me, me growing up in the neighborhood, uh, and you're about 10 years older than me, and I'm, and I'm a kid, and I started hearing your name. And uh, you were definitely not the guy to hold, take slack. You were a guy to get very aggressive, whether it was fighting, bats, knives, guns. And you built some reputation that I started to look up to, I guess, as Gene did the same with our age group, because uh, we're uh, all uh, about 10, 15 years apart from each other. And I think that, uh, you know, followed suit. But what you started doing is you started staying with guys uh, that I became partners with later on in life when you left. Or at the end of your career, I would say, on the street, where you were changing your life. You were partners, or known to be partners, with Ronnie Von Arm, and later on, and I was known to be his partner. So, you know, you must have a lot of stories to tell uh, you guys, and I'm talking about your friendships and some of the street stuff you guys did. And then later on, guys like, we had mutual friends of Frankie Burke, Jimmy Burke's son, and, and, and things like that. You could tell the guys in the neighborhood about people that are listening, about, you know, old time stories and you know, how you got into changing your life from these type of guys and guys like Nicky Carrazzo to uh, uh, changing life and leaving it to guys like me and then me coming full circle and now a guy like Gene and now he's trying to come full circle. Well, yeah, I, you know, I, I, you, what I was trying to get at, at the age of like 18 years old, we had a bar fight and somebody got killed and I was wanted for it. The only reason why I say that is not to build myself. I was just wanted for it. I'm not telling you I did it, but I'm just telling you I was wanted for it. And Fat Andy was the one that hit me out. So I was away from my family from the age of 18 years old until I was 20 years old, just hiding out in different places. And that, I think, the fact that when I got arrested when I was 20 years old, and I got arrested for two murders in possession of a weapon, and the fact that I stayed in, you know, didn't say nothing, I, took the weight of everybody, whatever was involved in it, waited to get bailed out. And then when I came out, I started hanging out with Nikki at that time. And then I would be paraded out around as, you know, one of the up and coming stars. So that kind of built, built up my reputation and going to other places, other families and people knowing about me. Uh, but, uh, you know, what you're saying about hanging out with the, these guys and stuff like that, that's, what, you know, that's just what I was. When I went away in 82, and came out in 84, probably somewhere like towards the end of 84 is when I started hearing a lot about you. So you kind of filled with up those. I don't know if you were around in 82, 82, 82 and 84. Yeah, I was still young. I just started coming around in 82 like that. Yeah, well, I was away. So you kind of did fill my spot. So when I came out, it was just I had to start kind of like in a sense I had to start all over again. But then, you know, what happened with me was we started doing a lot of things, and, and uh, you guys stood over by by 84th Street, and I kind of stood more in the Brooklyn area by Crescent Street, and the after hour with Tito's and stuff like that there. So, I mean, I had a great reputation. I think the biggest flaw that I had was I became a legend in my own mind, and the problem with that, what made me different than most other people, I didn't value my life. Right. And therefore, I didn't value anybody else's life. Right. I was the type of guy that you weren't going to beat me up. You had to kill me. And not a lot of people wanted to do that there. Or maybe not a lot of people had the nerve to do that there, so to speak. Because if they try to beat me up, they know that that wasn't going to be the end of it. You know what I mean? And that's just kind of like how I was until, you know, the party of well, those scenes came in and, and you know, kind of messed up. Think, you didn't think. You just did, right? I have the same thing. You just do it. Consequently, well, think we don't have. Right. Nikki groomed me, I'll tell you the truth there. Nikki groomed me, and Nikki was groomed by Fat Andy. So there's all the reflections handing down from Fat Andy, grooming Nikki, and then Nikki grooming me. And there's two things that I that Nikki told me right away. He said, never let nobody know what you're thinking, and definitely never let nobody how you feel. Those are the two things that stood with me for a long period of time. And one of the other things he said to me before I even really started doing anything for him was, Whatever I ask you to do, you just do it and never ask me why. So there was no time for me to think. Somebody asked me to do something, I didn't ask them, well, why do you want me to do it? I just went and did it. Yeah, Nikki, in a sense, was my dad, in a sense, in, in that lifestyle. And I, and I still love Nikki. Yeah, I have no bad feelings well, against any of these guys. Robert, Nikki is, and me and G talked about it, and me and Anthony, and uh, before, prior to that, Albert, 
we all actually respect Nicky uh, as a street guy. All of us do. We think he was uh, uh, a tough guy in the in the life when we're talking about the life and the guys that we want to behave like and act like. And when we're aggressive, I think all of us feel the same. We don't respect our own life. So when you're an aggressive guy, I don't think if you don't respect your own, you can't respect others. And uh, we happen to like Nikki. And I don't think any of us say, have anything to say about Nikki because in that life, whether we believe it or not, he was a true gangster. And, you know, going back to true gangsters, you mentioned your German last name. Somebody asked me the other day about Joe Watts. Joe Watts was, uh, and, they, you know, I haven't answered it. And since you brought up your, your German last name, Joe Watts was Gotti, as you know. Gotti seen his good friend. And Joe Watts was a sharp dresser, a hell of a guy. And he was really a tough guy. He was on that street. He was respected by every crew, every family. So somebody asked me uh, online the other day about talking about Joe Watts. And, you know, and I'll say it again. The street has no nationalities. It's only about uh, respect of somebody that's aggressive on the street or money makers and uh, building alliances with tough guys, I guess, with each other. And I think it goes back to you again, Robert. You were a, your own man back on the street. You were raised by some of these guys, but you went in a different direction in your life. And that's really what what I wanted to ask you more about today, because you know what we're doing with kids. You know what Gene's helping me do with kids now. So tell us how you made that transition from the uh, tough guy, street guy, shooter to uh, uh, a man that is in faith in God and changed your life. Really, that's the more interesting story. And that's what I want kids to follow now. Well, uh, yeah, no, I love sharing about that. That's that's the exciting part of my life today, not not my past, but where I am today. You know, I you know, I do a lot of speaking engagement stuff like that. I speak to young kids too. I do whatever I can to encourage kids. But I just be honest, and I always am. That's just who I am today. Is I'm more interested in people's souls than I am interested in anything else. I want to see people have a good life. But I'm interested in another life after this life. That's that's where what my my thing is. You know, I'm more interested in the spiritual life of of, of of and of course my faith. You know, all of us have distribute faith in, in a daily basis. But I mean, we go and we sit in a chair. We don't make sure it can hold us up. We just trust that the chair is going to hold us up. We go on an airplane. We don't check the pilot, see what he's going to do. We just trust that that pilot's going to. So we're, there's a a faith based kind of trust that when we do certain things and every, but the, the, for me, it's, it's, it's the object of my faith. And my object of my faith is Jesus Christ. And how I came to know Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior is when everybody turned their backs on me. And that's the bottom line. Now, I'm not saying I don't know the reason why they did it. I know that, listen, I was an embarrassment for a while, man, because, you know, I was the tough guy in the street. I got involved with, do, uh, with, with, putting drugs out there because that was where the money was at that time. I mean, numbers wasn't a big thing anymore. You know, OTB opened up, so bookmaking wasn't a big thing. I mean, you could have made a couple of dollars, but you could never make the big money. And, you know, the bottom line is the more money you have, the more power you have, the more power you have, the more respect you're going to get. That's just part of the lifestyle that we choose to live. But I can say this here, though. Whatever I truly believed is how I lived. When I truly believed in that lifestyle, man, I lived it out to the fullest. I met, you know, everybody knew, and I'm not trying to brag on myself, but everybody knew who I was. And you know, the kind of weird thing is, when people heard Robert Angle, they didn't know that I wasn't Italian because I looked so Italian. They didn't okay. know I was German. They thought Angle was the way that I used to fight. Your hair is What? Your hair is Yes, I am. Right. Yeah, I'm my mom, yeah. And I so, so, so Robert, was the half Italian yeah. side the aggressive side or the German side? Because I, to me, that's back to the same thing. So people understand. I don't think it mattered what side of you was was aggressive that day or shooting. I think it's you in general, like you just said. You rode the life to the fullest, whatever direction you believed in at the time. So it's to the point of nationality has nothing to do with making a man. Right. No. But the fact is, if you didn't have a father, an Italian last name, you weren't going to get straightened out. That was part of my goal, too, until I found out that that couldn't happen. And I was hoping that I would be bad enough or big enough that they would change that, because they changed it. At one time, you had to be, both your parents had to be Italian. And then they changed it. Like no. Nowadays, you don't. 
Yeah, yeah, I know that. I know that. Mind, I just got straightened out. He's seventy-five percent Irish, <laughs> okay, and twenty-five percent. That's what I'm saying. Now right. it's not. But as long as it, is his father have an Italian name? That's it. His last name's Italian. That's all they look for. Well, they only check one side now. They all right. Take that back in seventy-five when they opened up the books again. But before that, you got to be full Italian. Right. Understanding. But but neither today here or there about that. But the thing for me is is uh. Like I said, I started, and, and I have to, and what I do is I'm very transparent with my life because I don't want, you know, back, people back home, if they're going to watch this here, they need to, to, you know, I can't sugarcoat anything and I can't uh, compromise anything about it. I, I, I started selling drugs. I started doing drugs. And before you know it, the drugs was doing me. Now, I know everybody was doing drugs, but I went a little extreme in that sense, in that part of my life too, that that's my personality, I guess. So I got caught up pretty bad. So I can understand people saying, hey, he's better off in jail than putting him back on the street. I can understand thinking them saying, hey, we got to stay at distance of the right. Because whether any addiction that you have, whether it was gambling, anything like that, that was still, a, from what, what I, the way I grew up, was still a sign of weakness. Yeah, but oh, will be. Robert, they were all selling drugs, though. I, I mean, uh, no, but I, I know that there. Yeah. For me, I got caught up like, Right. I'm not going to put anybody out there who was right. doing drugs who's not doing drugs. And some people handle a little bit better. Yeah. I was a social drug user, party guy, went to discos, went to clubs every night of the week. I had a different club that I used to go to. And cocaine started coming with me, and I'd be partying. I was a social. Rob, but, <laughs> Rob, but I, I got to cut you off because I know you like to, and, and for the people that don't know you, you own you. I already know you for how many years now since I'm a kid. So you own you, and, and, and I know that, and I pre I know people out there that do drugs or didn't do drugs will appreciate what you're saying, but I know about 90% of people that are on the street, they're fooling around doing drugs. It's part of the life on the street. So I don't think, I know you're a hard judge of yourself, but I, I think that if people are honest about their behavior and uh, about what goes on in the street, everybody's selling, they're all using, they're gambling, the street is the street. That's why it's the street. So I, I think the ability, what Gene was just saying to you, you're not the only guy out there right. doing that. Miles, can we you appreciate that you're trying to tell kids this. Right. But, you know, if you recognize this and you, 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 you're you lecturing kids on the street not to follow this and to own what, you, what you've what you done, I, and really it's respectable. And this is, again, why I used to follow you back then as a kid trying to amigate what you did. And, and now I'm trying to follow you now. And... Uh, you know, change my life the same way you were proven to change your life for a couple of decades now, and Gene's on that path. And I think that's the important message, and I'm going to go back to the important message. Well, what I, what I was trying to bring out was basically when I found myself back in prison again, you know, I've been in out of prisons from 1975 to 1940 to, uh, to 1997. I've been in out of prisons, jails, Always had either, if I wasn't in jail, I had cops looking for me, want warrants and stuff like that. So I had that there. And the last time I went in is because I got caught selling drugs to another cover agent. Nikki and them bailed me out of that there, which I didn't think they were going to do, and they did. And then I found out that I had warrants in Florida because everybody got pinched in a case that we had in Florida. So I know if I went to court, I'm going to get locked up for that. And I didn't want to go. I didn't want to get, get locked up for that. So I didn't, just didn't go to court. And I just hung out in the streets for a while. When well, I you beat some court, serious cases before that, Robin. Oh, yeah. Well, I mean, it, they, you were accused of, and I, you know, and I don't want to put you out there, but you were accused of some serious shootings, some uh, murders. And I'm not saying you did them or didn't do them, but you were accused of them. And, uh, again, you changed your life. You're such a positive life now. It doesn't really matter. But I know you as such an aggressive guy in the past, and your life's been so different. And that's really, uh, honestly, that's where the judgment is, is now. And none of us could go backwards. It doesn't matter what we did. It doesn't matter. You can pull your hair out forever. Our past is our past. It's what you're doing today and what you've done, in, you know, besides that and what you're going to do in the future. Okay. Well, let's get to that then. Well, let's leave all, all that. But, yeah, the fact is my first arrest was for my first arrest as an adult because I got arrested when I was a kid twice. But my first arrest for adult was for two murders in possession of a weapon. And, and back in 75, that was kind of like not too many young kids got arrested for 
And I kind of build up my reputation and, and put me out there a little bit. But what do I do today? Listen, I'm in prison. I accepted Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior. When everybody else turned with their back on me, that's when I, I knew of God, but I didn't know God. And there's a big difference because a lot of people know of a God, but don't know God, a personal relationship. So I started reading the Bible. I started studying the Bible. I started doing this, and I started wanting to live. Now, when everybody, and I think this is God-ordained, and people may think I'm crazy, but let me just tell everybody this here. The life that I lived didn't make me crazy. It, it, so I, I'm not I'm I'm not the guy that's brainwashed or anything for what I what I what I do. I'm a pretty sane person. Everybody I think who knows me today knows that there. But when I started following the Bible and listening, reading it and studying the Bible and understanding that Christ died for my sins and what he did for me, you see, the difference and I don't talk religion, I talk faith. And the object of my faith is Jesus Christ. If he came and died in my place while I was still an enemy towards him, then I want to give my life to him. And that's what I did. I surrendered my life over to him. So I live according to, as best as I can, the ability that God has given me by the grace of God that he has given me to live a godly life, a life that examples. In other words, to be a Christian means to be a follower of Christ. And I can't be a Christian if I'm following everything else, myself or anybody else. But that's just how I live. So I go around speaking to kids. So I go into rehabs and I have a list in front of me all the obligations that I had and, and continue to do. With young kids, when I speak to young kids, there's two things I try to really teach them. First of all, even at a young age, and I believe it was Shakespeare that said, every decision you make will determine whatever life you're gonna live. Every decision, whether it's a small decision or a big decision, if you look at my past life, decisions that I made, dropping out of school when, when, when I wasn't even supposed to drop out of school, you know, playing hooky when I was in ninth grade and never going to ninth grade, don't have much of an education, really didn't care for that life or anything like that. Bad decisions. So I try to tell kids, I share my story about where I was to let kids understand that these are decisions I made. I can't blame anybody else for these decisions but me, myself. They're ones that I made. I have to take responsibility for the decisions I made in life. So Shakespeare's put it plain and simple. Whatever decisions you make is going to determine where you're going to go in life. And I made a lot of bad ones. But there was one decision that I made that changed the whole outcome of the, all those other decisions. And that was my decision to surrender my life to Christ. And I've seen my life change dramatically since then. I don't have the desires that I used to have. You know, it's 20-something years I haven't had a drink, a cigarette, or a drug in my body. And it's nothing that I, I go out and say, okay, I'm just not going to do these things. I just have no desire to do these things no more. And it's only by the grace of God. So that's how I try to live. So when I tell kids consequential thinking, I never used consequential thinking. I responded. I mean, if somebody called me up 5 o'clock in the morning, I'm having a problem. I ran out of my house. You know, one thing I used to, and it's kind of like a joke, but it's, you know, maybe people will find it amusing, maybe some people will find it stupid. But when people used to say to me, I said, I never left home without my American Express card. And they said, what do you mean by that? And I said, my gun was my American Express card. I never left my house without one. Well, most people never carried a gun. I always had a gun. Right. That's just, that right. was just me. You know, I wasn't going to keep fighting people. I have probably any knuckles left on my hands anymore from, from hitting people. And I wasn't going to do that anymore. I was going to make sure that, listen, if you mess with me, these are the consequences, Jeff. But I didn't think of the consequences. I used to tell people this here, John. I used to tell them back in those days, you said, I can be either your best friend or your worst enemy. It's your choice. The way I used to think back then is so contrary to the way I think today. You know, I don't think like that anymore. You know, I love all people, man. All people, I try to carry the message of Christ to wherever I can go, whatever uh, opportunity that I, that I have. That That's just who I am. You see, it's not what I do, it's who I am. It's who I am is what I do. I don't know if people understand that. So consequential thinking is something that I never use, that I would tell kids to think of the consequences. I try to tell my daughter that there. If you have three drinks and you go out and drive, and God forbid an accident happens. Somebody runs in front of you, regardless if it's your fault, it's not your fault. If you were really drunk, you weren't really drunk, and you killed her or him, whatever it was, that person, and they took your blood test, 
they're going to show you over the limit. And you could destroy your whole life for just for what? To have an extra drink? But, but, but Robin, see, see what you're saying makes sense. But when they're younger, just like us, they don't think before they react. And, and right. Gene, you could tell us how your thinking goes as, you know, because you're younger. You're back at that age right now where you did the same thing as what he's talking about. It's crazy because, like, history repeats itself. Like, I'm looking at it so crazy. Like, I'm living, I was living your life and living your life at one time because I didn't, I did not think before I did anything. I just, did first, ask questions later, and it's good to explain that to kids. Like you know, you could see from generation to generation. Like you're you're older than you and then me. It's history repeating itself. You have to stop them while they're young and explain. Look at us. You know, we could be a perfect example of what happens when you make the wrong decisions. You will end up either dead or in jail, and that's ultimately usually the outcome with that lifestyle. So um. It's crazy. I'm I'm just watching how it's just generation three generations right now look looking at it. It's pretty wild. Yeah. Well, you look at it, Robert. You lived in my in-laws' house. I don't know if Gene knows that. You lived in a base, my in-laws' house, and at the time when you were very wild, Robert. And my in-laws loved you. You know that. You know before my mother-in-law passed, she talked about you. Me, me, and you discussed it, and uh, they looked at you as you. And just what you're saying for the people that knew you from the street, if they got in your way. Obviously, they didn't like you because they feared you. So, you know, depending on your meet people and what Gene just said, you know, unfortunately, when we're younger, we don't have a mindset as you're older. When you're older, you're more settled. You think clearly. You don't think and react. Now you, you think before you react. Then you just react. So I think that's the key of, of you know, obviously age, the key of God, the key of uh, wanting to change your life, for whether it's for yourself and for Jesus. And some people say, well, we're not, you know, they don't want to hear about us talking about God or whatever religion they are. It's not even so much talking about how you live or I live or Gene lives. It's us talking about living the right life and making the right choices for themselves and their family so they don't suffer. Because, you know, Gene, we talk and Robert, you know, we've been we've went through some suffering. Our victims suffered. Our family suffered. And there's people that are never going to recover for what we did. There's people that. In my case, and and I won't speak to you guys, there's people's lives that are lost because of me. And there's no way to get that back, except for to try to reach some kids like we're doing today. And for you, Robert, obviously, is, uh, uh, you, you know, I got to commend you for what you're doing because you're helping, not only helping other kids, but you're helping guys, whether it's me or, or Gene, to do the same thing. Let's just give back and try to save some kids' lives. Well, yeah. You see, the thing that I try to... Say when I use consequential thinking and, and making decisions, every decision you make, you need to think about them because they're going to have a reflection on what type of which way you go in life. My biggest regret today is that I don't have an I didn't have an education. And I'm going to say something to you. It's only by the grace of God that, that, and I don't even know how, but I have an associate's degree in biblical studies. When I didn't, you know, it's just biblical studies, but. I never liked school, and all of a sudden now I'm, I'm going to school at that, that time when I, when I first came out. But one of the things I want the kids to see is they don't have to go through what I went through to get to where I am. You understand? They don't have to free. You see, they say a smart person learns from their mistakes. But a wise person, a wise person learns from somebody else's mistakes. I tell kids, try to be wise. Learn from the mistakes I made. Let me share my story of where I went, the jails I was in, all the things that, that, that I, I did, how many families I destroyed. I mean, that's the truth of the matter. I did. I destroyed my own family. Why would you want to make those decisions for yourself? I... Well, there's enough pain in life now. Listen, there's a kid. There's, he's not a kid. He's a, he's a guy, and he's a friend of mine. He's a Jewish guy. His name's Mark, and uh, he just recently lost his father and uncle to COVID. There's so much suffering that's going on, and there's so many good people like Mark, right? And you meet these people, and you forget about real life when you're doing some crazy things that we did or kids are doing, or Gene just got out, or he did, and you forget about some of these nice people that I'm just like Mark, and I just mentioned that sometimes your life gets turned around a little bit, and we forget the direction. And it's like, you know, you're heading in the wrong direction, and you can't turn your car around, or you can't stop short. And the message from you and Gene or Myself or whoever is giving the message is stop your car short and turn around and go back in the right direction so you don't suffer. And really, you know, that's so important what you're doing, Robert. 
Well, well, thank you. I mean, you know, it's not this. This is one of the things that, that, that for me, this is for me. It's not what I do, but why I do what I do. You see, I have a purpose. God has given me a purpose. He has a, a plan that's bigger than anything I can. I mean, there's no way in the world you can go back 30 years ago and think that I'd be doing what I'm doing today. And nobody would ever believe that. You know what I mean? I got the opportunity, not that I know how to write, I didn't write the book, but I got the, the opportunity to find a ghostwriter who wrote a book about my story, about my life. But it's more about what I do today, uh, not so much about glorifying my past. Because I want to glorify my Jesus. That's my goal in life. Is to get people, and I, I, I'm not trying to convert anybody as much. I'm trying to do is just introduce them to Jesus. So read the Word of God and let it t see where it goes for you. That's that's what I did. I didn't have no idea. Like I knew of God, but I didn't know God. It's just like I can say I, I, well, I, I know of President Trump, but I can't tell you much about him because I really don't know him. You understand? So that that's kind of what I try to teach. Kids and I try to get them into that pit because, like I said, I'm more interested, and I'll just use my daughter for an example. I'm more interested in my daughter's eternity than I am in, interested in how she enjoys life here right now. Not that I want her to be have a bad life, but th my main thing is I want to spend eternity with my daughter. That's that's just where I, I see myself today, you know, and that's what I, I love to do. So I go into schools, I, you know, wherever God opens up a door for me to go, and it doesn't always have to be. A Jesus thing, you know, it doesn't have to always be. As long as I can help somebody to make a good decision for their life, and hopefully, like I said, I try to introduce the Bible wherever I go. Read the Word of God. If you don't like it, you can always have your misery back. That's all right. See, God changed me from the inside out, not from the outside. Right. The way I think, the way I feel, the way I behave, all these things, I don't wake up in the morning saying, okay, here's a list of all the things I need to do to show God how much I love Him. I love God because I want to, not because I have to. And there's a big difference. The things I do today, it's not because I have to do them, because I want to do them. That's the desire that God's given an important place in my heart. I want to do these things. I don't get paid for half of the things that I do. Every book that's sold, I don't get any money from it. It goes into the ministry. So this way, when people can't afford me to have, like, I'll just give you a for instance. I had to go to Minnesota last year. They had a $500 budget. That Practically, practically would just pay for the plane ticket, never mind a hotel for food. And for myself, I had to take off three, four days from work at that point in time as I was working. And I went to my board, and my board said, you know, that's not probably the best thing to do. And I said, if we could just get one child to think differently, because there was 350 kids I was going to speak to, it's well worth us taking the chance and putting money. So whatever money we get into the ministry, we use for opportunities like that. That they can't afford to have me there. And I don't want to tell somebody, you can't afford to have me. That's not just not who I am. I want to go. I want to help people. It's because of what I want to do. Not for the money, not for anything. You know, that's just how I live my life today. And I have no regrets. I wouldn't say I don't have no regrets. Let me, let me, because I do have some of the regrets of the past decisions that I made. Like I said, that one decision. You regret to change in your life, basically. Right. You don't regret. Right. It's the best thing you ever did. Yeah. You know, uh, listen, the, the fact is, you know, people are going to know it is anyway. You know, my daughter was only seven weeks old and I walked out on her life. I'm not happy about that. You know, I, I see I did a lot of damage because of that. You know, but what, what I did and the way I changed my life, whether you guys want to want to hear this or not it's, a, it's up to you guys but i decided to cooperate with the government because i no longer believed in the lifestyle of the mafia anymore i seen too much of what was going on i seen too much of the phoniness that's involved in it i seen that it's what can you do for me lately if you can't do nothing for me lately then i'm not going to do anything for you that's just the lifestyle that it was it wasn't like that when i was a younger guy but it being end up becoming that Guys that were getting straightened out, I couldn't even imagine them ever getting straightened out. I, I mean, I think that kind of ruined everything. And that, I'm just speaking for, for my own experience of guys getting straightened out because they were somebody's cousin or relative or something like that. There, I mean, it ruined it because there's guys on the street that were really doing some hard work, you know, the tough guys in the neighborhood, and yet they weren't getting recognized that way. Other, these other people weren't. So... I just thought it was a bunch of baloney after a while, after a point of time in my life. 
And when the government gave me the opportunity, I'm just going to be as plain and direct as possible, man. I looked at my life. I evaluated my life when I was in there. Knew nobody was going to help me. And I said, okay, I could either come out. I'm never going to get where I wanted to go because already that, that kind of life was, was already over for me. I already blew my reputation. She wasn't trying to go out there at the age of 40-something years old and start doing the things I did when I was 15, 20 years old. And the other thing was I had a problem with drugs. And I didn't want to go out to do that anymore. So when the government came and offered me something, that I, I just took the offer. I, I'm not mad at anybody. I just took the offer because I thought that was the best thing for me at that point in time. But I'll tell you this here. Even through all that there, I can see God's hand in my life. But there's no way in the world that I should be alive today. No right. way in the world. I'm with you on that. Same with me. And same with Johnny. <laughs> exactly. So we have that in common. My you mother know? says it all the time. You're lucky to be alive, right? <laughs> right. Well, Robin, you know, Gene, you guys are Robin. Here, Frankie Burke, we had a lot of laughs with him. He's dead. Got killed. Fat Larry Cucarelli, he was actually a decent guy, Larry. And, uh, you know, I always liked him. He wasn't a vicious guy. He was a nice guy. And there was a lot of times I know when you were having your troubles, he was good to you. He, he did some things for you. I don't even know if you recall. But he, he wasn't a bad guy. There were some guys that, you know, all these guys, one after another, are dead. The Tito from the gate. I mean, one we could go through names. He's dead. So Angelo Castelli, he's dead. Guys that grew up with us uh, since we're younger and I started catching up to, you know, to what you were doing, as I got a little older, we started uh, mingling a little bit more than when, you know, obviously I was too young so at, at your age of 17 or 20. But when you got in your late 20s, I came around. I'm in my or, you know, late teens. And we started mingling with the same guys. And most of them are dead. I wouldn't say so. You know, when people asking, what are we trying to convey? We're trying to convey don't lose your life. We're fortunate enough to have our lives even be sitting here talking about it. Because all those guys, and I can keep going with that list, and so can you, Robin and Gene. There's guys, some of your friends that are, are dead, Gene, and Robin, yeah. we can keep going. So it's either what life's about, right? Life's about joking and laughing, having a good time. Well, we're, not, we're not doing this. Gene's on the phone with me constantly. All we do is joke and laugh. Uh -huh. I mean, that's what life's about, playing around, laughing, talking, you know, having a good time. It isn't about talking about death and committing crimes. So, you know, it, for you to get involved in your life, Robert, with Jesus and the church, you had to go through your, you know, tribulations, which you did. You came out the other side, and your message is really, I don't know too many people that's going to deny that message because it's such a positive message. And the message is not about you personally, like you said. It's about, you know, Jesus and, and people living a right life in God. And whether you believe in that and you don't want to follow that path, but follow the path of a good life is really the message. I mean, if I remember correctly, did you go to Africa also and, and helping with kids there and, and building homes and stuff? Is that is that, was that accurate, Robert? Was that you that did that? What's that, John? Uh, John, you you went to Africa and you okay. got involved. I, I went twice already to Africa. I have a ministry out there. It's on hold right now because there's some move, movements that are being done. But yeah, I was out there twice already. I mean, if you ever want to. Feel how blessed the United States is. I'll take you with me someday. You can see these guys eat once a day. They broke my heart when I seen them, when I spent some time with them. And I promised these kids who are living in a field without any parents. And I'm talking about a field with animals. That's where they live. And it wow. broke my heart that I told them when I leave here, I promised that I would try to help you. And I, I kept my word to them. And when I came back to the States, I do fundraisers now and I send money to them. These kids now, have some of them have a place to live. They built a home for these kids. They built a home for the girls. They have water. They have food. Now I'm working and, and trying to do some more and trying to get them a trade to do so they can go out and start earning money for themselves. So we're trying to bring a teacher in there that can teach them a trade. We're trying to get money for tools and stuff like that. That's all part of what I do. It's not about me. It's about me helping people because the way that God has changed my life, I want to I wanna use it to the ultimate of that I possibly can to help change somebody else's life. I, I was there, Robert, on, on, a, on a bad note, actually. I was there on a the run. So I, I, I'm familiar with Africa. I was in West Africa for a while. And actually, I got some good friends out there. And I have one guy that I'm a very personal friend still. 
that helped me back then when I was in trouble and on the run. And I have another friend who was just uh, suffering bad. He just got out of jail from Africa. So, I, you know, I, I know the region. And I, and I, I got some uh, good friends there and family that, of my friends. So, I, I, you know, I know the difference in their life and, and the suffering they got. And what you did there also, some of the things that you do is so commendable. I mean, that, that this is Robert that I want people to know. Honestly, that's why I asked you to come to the show. Robert, the, the guy that was the shooter, uh, isn't Robert. That's somebody else from the past. Sometimes when we talk about it, like I said, it's like we're talking about somebody else, not yourself. Because you're this person now, and it's like Gene is becoming who you are right now, not who you used to be. Nobody wants to know about that. I right. mean, people, you know, it's a story. It's a past. You can't change it. But that's not Robert Engels. No. I'll give you this here. This is my favorite scripture. I'm not trying to preach to anybody. This is my favorite scripture. It's Galatians 2.20. It goes like this here. This is Paul the Apostle writing this here to the church. He says, I've been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And the life I now live in the flesh, meaning the body, I live by faith in the Son of God who gave himself for me. That's my life. It's no longer me living. It's a me allowing Christ to live through me. And Christ so loved the world that he died that everybody could have their sins forgiven and have eternal life if you just believe in him. That means it's very simple. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one goes to the Father except through me. So that's where I base my faith around, is what Christ had done for me, you know, allowing him to come inside and live through me. That means I have to yield everything that I had possession of in my heart. And he changed it. Matter of fact, even the name Borelli, how I got that name, was a, going from the witness protection program. They asked you for, you know, if you keep your first name, they changed it now, but you have to change it. They said you could keep your first name, but you have to change your last name. And I would give them names, and they would say, no, that's no good, and then, then come back again. And I happened to be watching this episode of MASH. And on this MASH, this day, the, the, the unit, the, the, the MASH unit had to send for an outside doctor to come in to do a heart transplant. And when they came in, his name was Borelli. <laughs> they came in, I said, Borelli. And they went, now, I, I know it sounds weird, but the thing is, I needed a heart transplant. I needed God to change my heart from the way I was to the way that he wanted me to be and where he created me to be from the beginning. And I surrendered that to him, and he's doing everything through me. It's not more, it's not saying I don't mess up. I would never tell you I don't mess up. I sometimes get angry and say some things that I shouldn't say, uh, but he's changed so much in my life. And the main thing for me is that I don't have the desires to live anywhere the way I used to live. And I want to be an example of him. I don't want them to see Robert Borelli or Robert Engel, especially Robert Engel. I want them to see the Jesus in me. That's, that's, that's just how I live my life. And I'm so grateful for it. So I don't have any qualms with anybody, man. Whatever anybody's doing, I don't waste my energy on what they're doing. Well, Gene, you, you know, just what Robert just said, at your age, and I, and I know you have temptations, yeah. and I know your temperament, and I know you're old school, but you're a wild guy. And I know the difference is, and you tell me if I'm wrong, is you're not reacting anymore. Your no. brain mechanism thinks the same, but you then know it's gonna get the reaction. You tell us. Right, Robert. So, like, you know, people know I had a, I'm, a, I'm a hothead, so, you know, they're trying to drag me out of character, and it's hard for me, but I'm doing it, and I'm trying to stay calm, you know, because the old me, I would just jump off, you know, just go crazy, and um, I'm trying so hard, I'm, I'm being good now, you know, like me and him, Johnny talk all day, and I'm just, you know, I'm controlling myself, you know, so I know I'm changing because I can never control myself, so now I'm doing that, and it's hard, but I'm doing it, you know, every day, like, I, I would like to tell a young kid, you know, Take, take it day by day, and slowly but surely, you will become a different person if you want to. Yeah. Right. One of the key things is, is what, what the Bible speaks about, and I truly believe in it. Is, is, first of all, I give you the emphasis. The mind is like a computer. If you go on your computer, you put on the Johnny and Gene show, you're not going to get the Hannity show. You're going to get the Johnny and Gene show. Whatever you put into your computer is what's going to come on display from your computer, right? The mind is the same way. What you put in your mind is what is it. So the Bible talks about renewing the mind, not to start thinking the way we think. So for me, how I renew my mind is through the Word of God. 
I try to live what he's teaching me the best way to live. And God, I mean, you went through this here a few times. But I always tell you, never let anybody push your button because that's what they're going to do. Don't let somebody rob you of your joy. They don't, don't give them that kind of power in your life. Because people are going to push your button. It's part of life. That's the way it is. Circumstances and situations are still going to come. I don't have the most glamorous life. I mean, I don't know if these people who think the witness protection program, because I'm not in it anymore, that's why I can talk about it, to think that it's like my blue haven, like, or heaven, whatever that movie was, that we all got together and now we're running and living in a luxurious life, man. I worked 17 years as a valet parker, parking cars. To me, back in them days, was you, you don't even think of doing something like that. Like It was like kind of the lowest kind of life you could possibly live, taking people's cars, hoping that they're going to give you a tip. I did it for 17 years. 17 years for $10 an hour. My biggest raise was two years ago, I got $11 an hour. <laughs> So I'm not living the glamorous life. And like I said, whatever whatever the ministry does, there's nobody in this ministry takes a pay or anything like that there. Wow. It goes into the ministry. So this way we can go back out there when people invite us who don't have the money to, to, to support. Robbie, you're not laughing. Out there. What? I'm not laughing that you said $10 an hour. But I remember I called you, if you remember, and I was going to do an armored van. And uh, I think they had about uh, 800000 we were supposed to do together. But I'm just thinking about the mindset. We're taking 800000 back in whatever year it was, 94, say. I don't even remember the year. Around whatever it was. And now you're talking about $10. I know the transition is difficult. And, uh -huh. and people don't understand. It takes discipline. And that's what I told Gene the same thing. Because I know he's I going through what we used to go through. It's very, it's very hard to hold that temper. And people are trying to bring it out. And it's so easy to go get that 800000 instead of working for it. So, you know, again, that's part of the, the walk you had to walk to get to the point that you got to here, to, to humble yourself, to be able to say, hey, I'm not going to live the way I used to. And, and again, it's back to the same message to Gene. And Gene carries the strongest message to these young guys because they can all relate to his age group. They're the guys that are on the street. You know that. The young guys are the guys. When people used to say that to me, what are you sending these kids for? I said, the kids are there to hurt you, shoot you. When you get an older guy, they're coming here to talk to you. So don't disrespect those kids or you're going to find yourself killed somewhere in a ditch. You know, so, you know, people got to understand about age. Age is, is when, you know, you, you're all, you, know you, you don't think and you're very aggressive. And, you know, so people better understand when they say, oh, this guy's just a kid. No, that's when you're aggressive, when, when you don't think about the consequences. And, Gene, you tell me that's everything we keep talking about. Absolutely. My worst years was 18, 19, 20, 21. That's when I was at my worst, you know. So as I got older, I started getting, you know, a little more calmer. I mean, you know, I'm still a hothead, but, you know, not as bad as when I was a kid. But when I was in Rikers Island, Robert, I was with these young kids, 17, 18, 19 years old, like you said, got nothing, no one looking out for them, and they're wild. And you, you try, even at that time, when I was a bad guy, I was trying to tell them, like, you know, man, you are just doing too much. You got to calm down. You know, you're going to end up dead or, or, you know, doing life in prison. And that's usually the outcome when you're acting like how we used to act and the things that we were doing. And there's only two spots or two outcomes. That's going to be dead or in jail. Exactly. That's what I want. And all of us escape a life in prison, which, let's be honest, we all deserve it. Right. Absolutely. Right. The things we did, yeah, we should be away for the rest of our lives. There's no doubt about that. And the fact is, is I don't know how many times I escaped date, uh, death without even knowing I was ex uh, escaping it. And then how many times Nikki had to come and bail me out of who up? Everybody wanted a piece of me, that's for sure. But you know what? This is this is one of the emphasis that I tr I try to make more important to that that well not more important but pretty important is is that. It's, it's, listen, we have a purpose and we have a plan now. I can't examine anybody else's, so I, I can't read people's minds and I can't read people's hearts and I definitely know everybody's motive, you know? But I could tell you this here, man. It's not so much what you're doing, but what I do for myself is I always examine why am I doing what I'm doing. And if it's to recognize me, you know, I know you think I'm weird, but I believe God spoke to me personally in my spirit. He said, make sure that you're not using me to bring attention to you. 
but make sure that I'm using you to bring attention to me. And I always keep that up front with me. Whatever I'm doing, I want people, it's for me just to introduce people to Jesus. Whether they want to accept him, whether they want to read a little bit more about him, that's what I try to do. The way that, you know, years back when we used to introduce one guy to another guy, you know, uh, maybe they can make things happen or we would get introduced to somebody for a robbery, whatever it was to be part of it, something like that. And I'm, that's the negative part of it. But that, that's what I, tr I try to do today. But let me tell you something. When my mom passed away, I was in the witness protection program. I didn't know my mom died until three days after she was dead. Nah. Anybody deserved the love that I had, this new love, this, this love of Christ that I had in my life it was my mother because what I put my mother through since I was a kid was just probably hell on earth, truthfully. And I wanted to give that love to my mom. And when she passed away while I was in the program and I didn't know, I couldn't even go to my mom's funeral. Yeah. I had, I had to, the last picture I have of my mother is through a plexiglass in, in Indian River County Jail talking to my mother. That's the last visual I, uh, that I have of my mom, you know? After that happened, you know what I started doing? I started going to nursing homes. And not just ministering the word of God, but treating all those people in nursing homes like if they were my mother. I would do functions for them every week. I was there every Saturday and every Sunday. And I'm not bragging about me. This is just what God has placed in my heart to do because I miss my mother and love my mother so much. And I just thought that God was saying, well, start giving that love to everybody else. And it helped heal me from the loss of my mom, to be honest with you. And I did it for 13 years straight. So I didn't come out of jail and try to get a platform for myself. I went to the lowest place. I went to Africa. I went to nursing homes. I did those things because of the love that God has given me and I'm going to tell you something. I've seen lives change in those nursing homes. I brought life where there was completely death. you got to remember, most of those people in the nursing home, it's the last time that they go in any place. It's going to be a place where, you know, I used to be raised Roman Catholic. I would say purgatory is where they're going to either it's heaven or hell, where they're going to go. You know what I mean? It's like their resting place. I try to do that there, and, and, uh, and the reason why I say that is because even still today, I, I, and for five years straight, where I live today, I was doing what we call the Senior Appreciation Day, just letting seniors know how much I love and how much I care about them and how I have a function for them, and the ministry helped me do all that stuff, so that's where most of everything goes with the ministry. Like I said, nobody gets a pay. I don't get any salary or anything like that for it. The books that get sold go to the ministry. Well, let me let me cut you where you're at, Rob, for a second. Where can somebody find your book if they want to find your book? How do they find you if they want to speak to you, if they want advice, some help in the direction with the church or with God or any programs you're involved with? Yeah, they can go to robertborelli.com. That's my website. They can go, if they want the book, they can go through uh, amazon.com. Matter of fact, my book was listed right next to your book. Okay. When you first read your book out, the the, the uh, God's rules. Yeah, yeah, God's rules. So uh, they can go there, BarnesandNoble.com. There's other ways to get it. The thing that happened with me is I never did anything like that, writing a book or anything like that. So the thing is, I had a first time writer write the book, and I was the first time ever doing something like this. Here. So we published, we self published the book without even a market plan. So a lot of people don't even know the book exists. But I'm getting a little bit uh, of discovery out there about the book through shows that I do and stuff like that. So, like I said, anybody that purchased the book, if you go through the website, it'll come to me, their name, their address. I would sign the book. I put scripture in the book. If they don't want scripture, they can specify. I don't want it. I just want the book. And I would sign it, and, and then I mail it to them. That, that's how it will go if they do it through. And it's for any donation on, on, on the website. So. Thanks, Robert. Hey, it was great having you on the show tonight. And, uh, you know, we'll talk, I guess, during the week and your message. I hope uh, the kids and, and men and children and women, whoever, uh, parents uh, receive the message and maybe some of their family needs help or guidance. They, they turn to you also. And Gene, I don't know if you want to wrap it up. And say yeah, um, I'd like to say, Robert, you know, I know I have so many family members that knew you 
knew you were a real deal street guy, knew you were dangerous, man. And I tell you, and I'm not just boosting. They say you are a dangerous guy. So if you could change your life, anybody can. You know what I mean? So I, I want to, I'm really, I'm really happy to finally really get to talk to you and meet you, man. And uh, yeah. remember this here, it's never, never, never too late for a new beginning in life. Never. No matter where you are, what circumstance you're in, how old you are, how young you are, it's never too late for a new beginning. And you guys are examples of that too. You're changing your life, so it's never too late. And that's what I emphasize more than anything is no matter where you're at, what's going on in your life, what problems you have, whatever the situation is, it's never, never, never too late for a new beginning. Well, I appreciate it, guys, for having me. All right, guys, day. thank you. Have a blessed day. All right, guys. All right. And I hope you to talk again. God bless, guys. We will. All right. Thank you, guys. Stay safe. All right. Bye. Bye. Hey guys, we want to sincerely thank you all for your support. If you enjoy the Johnny and Jean show, starting next week, it will be available exclusively on CrimeFlick.com. This is an all new, unique platform. Please visit CrimeFlick.com and subscribe. Thank you.